There is a second Eurovision beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of Lithuania's fears and the summit of Belarus's knowledge. This is a dimension of imagination, a world in which Sweden has abandoned all hope, in which Kazakhstan competes without opposition, and in which even San Marino has received their share of douze points. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. <clears throat> I mean, the Junior Eurovision Song Contest. Hello everyone, I am Tessellating Hexagons, and today I intend to talk about the Junior Eurovision Song Contest. I sort of did this sometime last year when I talked about my top 10 favourite entries there, but now I want to go into a bit more detail about the contest itself, to spread awareness, spread support, you get the idea, we're all open-minded here. and. It's funny, in a tragic sort of way. In my experience, a lot of Eurovision fans, especially the older ones, the ones who whinge and moan about the changes made to the modern contest relative to the good old days of 19 schwefty 12 whatever they tend to view the junior contest the same way that normal Eurovision haters view the regular contest, with scorn, cynicism, blind hatred, and just generally not a clue of what they're actually criticising, and all for literally zero valid reason. And yes, that is something I'm going to elaborate on in this video. <sighs> Somehow, these people don't see the irony of that much less that they, as a pocket of the fandom, act much less mature around their precious contest than an equivalent contest that is literally populated by nothing but children. But enough throwing shade. Let's start the celebrations by delving into the fast facts about the format. It was created by your friend and mine, the European Broadcasting Union, at the turn of the century, but, well, it's not quite that straightforward, really. As I explained last year, it started with the Danish broadcaster Danmarks Radio putting together a singing competition not unlike what we now know as The Voice Kids, but all the way back in the year 2000, and just for Danish kids. Then, in the two years that followed, it expanded to include Swedish, Finnish and Norwegian children too, under the banner of Melody Grand Prix Nordic. The EBU rather liked this idea for a format, and so built upon it to create what we now know as Junior Eurovision, though at the time they were planning on calling it quote, the Eurovision Song Contest for Children. Fortunately, they were talked out of that disaster party of a name in favour of the current one instead. Anyway, the first contest was hosted in 2003 by DR because of their experience with MGP Nordic. Obviously though, DR wouldn't host it every single year, since the contest changes hands every edition. In that regard, it's sort of like a microcosm of Eurovision, in that, like Eurovision, the previous year's winner is offered the chance to host, but, so as not to pile excess pressure onto the competitors, in Junior Eurovision, that offer is much more fast and loose, and thus is much more frequently declined. For instance, the 2014 edition was won by Italy, but they glossed over the hosting rights and passed them over to second place, and so the 2015 edition was held in Bulgaria, who, as I said, they were the runner-up in the previous year, and in doing that, the Italian broadcaster inadvertently, completely accidentally, convinced Bulgaria to come back to Adult Eurovision, but that's a story for another time. Anyway, it's currently directed by Eurovision head honcho Jan Orla Sand, but surprisingly, he was actually only given the position in 2016, after the sudden and unexpected dismissal of the previous executive supervisor Vladislav Yakovlev, who succeeded Sierto Baca and Svantas Doxelius in that order. Between the four of them, they've kept the Junior Eurovision flame burning bright and, well, bright, ever since its birth in 2003, with the 2018 edition seeing a record-breaking 20 countries taking part, and it's showing no signs of stopping anytime soon. So let's get into the details, shall we? Since its inception, 37-ish countries have taken part. What do I mean by 37-ish? Well, for one, Serbia and Montenegro have both competed in the contest separately, debuting in 2006 and 2014 respectively, but they did also field one entry in 2005 as a unified country prior to their separation. Similarly, 
the United Kingdom took part for the first three editions, and then withdrew, only for Wales to return as a completely separate entrant without the rest of the UK in 2018, and this is saying nothing of Scotland also separately debuting in Eurovision Choir of the Year 2019, so who knows what that means for the future. But for now, strictly speaking, there have been 39 uniquely named countries competing, but... well, you can see the complications in just saying that without any clarification. As for the format itself? Well, if you've seen Eurovision, you know exactly how it works. They're the same show after all, albeit with a couple of little quirks. For one, this contest has a hypothetical limit of 20 participating countries, which used to be a bit lower, but then 20 countries took part in 2018, so they... they flexible the rules a little bit. This is all just so that the show doesn't run excessively long for the children competing, and so that there are never any semi-finals. This is a conscious decision to avoid the kids having to face the potential disappointment of failing to qualify, and while I think the competitors would probably be mature enough to not let it get to them, I do still appreciate the consideration. Anyway, the show is always held in November, or early December sometimes, and it was originally held in the evening on a Saturday, just like its grown-up counterpart, until some bright spark in 2016, as part of a wave of changes to the format, decided to move it to a Sunday afternoon instead. I'm just gonna come right out and say it, I really think that's a stupid idea. I mean, sure, a Saturday night show means the kids are up late, but it's a special one-off, like, special occasion kind of treat, and they can sleep in the next day, which is still the weekend. Or at the very least, they can sleep on the plane on the way home, if necessary. By having the show on a Sunday, the kids are basically guaranteed to miss school at least on the following Monday because they have to travel back home to their respective countries, if not the Tuesday as well. But hey, at least they solved a problem that the audience at home never had to begin with. Voting-wise, it more or less keeps pace with the adult contest too, with a couple of fluctuations over the years. It started as a 100% televote affair, and then shifted in favour of being partly jury-driven, with an additional set of 1-12 to points being awarded by a kids' jury comprising nothing but other kids, and then, after one disastrous year of having 100% jury voting, plus on top of that, three individual jurors also voting as if each one of them were their own country as well, they finally settled on the current system, which is jury voting as in adult Eurovision, and in place of televoting, an online vote open to anyone in the world. I'll elaborate on that system later on in the video, but trust me, it works better than you might initially think. Before we go any further though, there's something of an elephant in the room that really, really needs to be addressed. For everything I've said so far, it sounds pretty good, doesn't it? a second, smaller Eurovision halfway between the editions of the adult contest, full of talented youngsters paving the way for the future of music in Europe. But if it really is so great, why don't the numbers seem to reflect that? Why was 2018 the first time in the show's history that the show was 20 countries big? Simply put, there are some Eurovision delegations out there who take the side of the more petulant pockets of the fandom, strawmanning what the junior contest represents and dismissing it accordingly. And other countries besides simply don't think that it's worth their time or money to participate. Well, joke's on them, really. But let's come back to that first category for a second. I called certain countries out the last time I spoke about the junior contest in one of these videos, and it bears repeating. Some delegations consciously build up a misrepresentation of what the junior contest is, or hold a very specific image in mind of what they want the contest to be versus what it actually is, and then use those preconceptions to justify their absence from the contest. The two biggest offenders in that regard are Denmark and Lithuania. Despite both countries being staple participants at adult Eurovision, without whom the semi-finals just wouldn't be the same, both nations' delegations have been rather outspoken in their dismissal of junior Eurovision, despite having racked up seven participations at the contest between them. Denmark, for one, has changed their tune a number of times over the years, no pun intended, but despite the EBU specifically asking them to consider returning recently, their current stance is that that's not likely as long as the contest remains the way it currently is. To paraphrase their position, they want to be tin pot dictators over what it means to be a child, and they don't like that the junior contest treats its competitors as sentient, sapient individuals rather than bubble-blowing toddlers who are incapable of looking after themselves. Basically, whoever gave the statement in question strikes me as the sort of person who would put their 16-year-old son or daughter at the kiddies table with their toddler cousins over Christmas dinner, or whatever, because of their own arbitrary definitions of what counts as a child versus an adult. 
Oh, do you think the Danish broadcaster might object to me summarizing their arguments in a vaguely strawmanish way? Well, pot kettle black, sirs and madams. To be more specific, their statement reads thusly. The values that we put in Denmark in a program for children do not match the values of the Junior Eurovision Song Contest. It seems that the children are on stage and play adults instead of acting as children, and we think that is fundamentally wrong. Children must be children. They should not try to strive to be something they are not. It's super bad for us because we really wanted to be a part of the show. Participating in a concept like Junior Eurovision would be a natural first step for us after MGP, but it does not work when we do not feel the show fits the Danish values. Or, to translate, The kids are being treated like people and that scares us old farts because it makes us feel redundant and the whole situation just reminds us of the inevitability that these kids will grow up to replace us someday. How ironic that I'm telling a group of adults that they need to grow up themselves. Now, don't get me wrong, Denmark's stance does irritate me to no end, but that doesn't mean that Lithuania is off the hook here. To quote their statement on the contest, This contest has become a clone of the main Eurovision Song Contest and has nothing to do with childhood. Little girls go on stage with clipped hairs, glued eyelashes and bare belly, copying Beyonce and Christina Aguilera. This is not an event we would like to participate in. So once again, Wah, the kids are being treated like people and not babies and that scares us. Wah, stop it. The sad thing is they almost almost have a point about the notion of rushing kids towards growing up too quickly, but the way they go about objecting to it is all wrong. Not to mention targeted at completely the wrong scapegoat here. I hear that line a lot in opposition to the junior contest, talking about how the performers wear too much makeup or objectionable costumes or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, there has never been an entry at the Junior Contest that presents its performers in a sexualized way whatsoever, and this is good because that would have extremely problematic implications. As for the idea of dressing up and wearing makeup for the performance, once again, may I direct your attention to Ukraine's winning performance in 2012, who usually takes the most flack in this regard. Anastasia Petrik raised no complaints whatsoever with her staging and presentation. She sang her heart out in a performance that, she felt, was an acceptable representation of what she wanted to bring to the table. And besides, playing dress up, especially as people that one idolizes, is a cornerstone of the very same idealized cotton candy childhood that these failures of moral guardians are trying to force on these kids in the first place. If the performers were being forced to act and dress a certain way against their will, there might be something valid here. But as it stands, all you're doing, Denmark, Lithuania, the rest, is getting secondhand offended on behalf of young people who don't want or need your incessant defense. I could rant about this for the rest of this video, but that would get very boring very quickly. So to wrap this section up, if you're going to be such massive brats about what you think the contest should be, and if you're going to kick up such a big stink over the children being treated as equal people and not fundamentally inferior beings just because of their age, then don't bother coming back at all. We don't want you and we won't miss you. End of discussion. <sighs> Okay, with all of that off my chest, let's get back on task here. As I alluded to earlier, the Junior Contest is largely the same as its adult counterpart, save for, well, the obvious. So let's look a little more closely at what the key differences are, just to fully appreciate the Junior Contest as its own beast. After all, it could be so easy to just carbon copy adult Eurovision but replace the participants with kids. But no, the producers have always gone that extra mile to give the contest its own identity, and in more than just a cursory few ways. For one, the Junior Contest is actually where the notion of a common song first came from. For a good few years now, part of each contest's opening act is all of the competing singers coming together to perform one unified song based on that edition's theme music and slogan. If memory serves, they tried that at the adult contest in 2014 and it didn't stick, but in the junior contest it's been a staple for quite a while now. Strictly speaking, that applies to the flag parade at the start of the show too, but well, that's still a routine part of Adult Eurovision 2, so that's not really much of a difference after all. The rules of the junior contest aren't quite one-to-one -one with its adult counterpart either. Granted, there have been some fluctuations over the years, but that's always been in order to move with the times, rather than to just outright copy the adult contest, despite accusations to the contrary from certain delegations that I've already complained about. 
For instance, at Adult Eurovision, each delegation is only permitted a maximum of six people on stage, not counting camera crew, during each performance. In the early days of Junior Eurovision, that limit was as high as eight. More recently, that rule has blurred somewhat, and now it's not quite as clear, since it seems like there are some years where you never see more than six people on stage at a time, but then the next year that rule is relaxed again. I don't know, it, it's a bit more lenient at the very least. Similarly, Adult Eurovision has had a limit, ever since as far back as the mid-20th century, that each song could, at absolute most, be no longer than 3 minutes 10, with a rough guideline of 3 minutes being the norm. Junior Eurovision, meanwhile, scaled back, back to 2 minutes 30, with 2 minutes 45 being the absolute upper limit. But again, this was changed with the times as of 2013 to reflect the wants, needs, and capabilities of the performers. And now the Junior Contest also has that 3 minute guideline with the plus 10 second tolerance. And then of course, there's the obvious one, the age of the competing acts. Another caveat that's fluctuated with time. Remember, at Adult Eurovision, competing artists must be at least 16 years old on the day of the contest, and there's no upper limit to that. Originally, the junior contest catered to the next bracket down in terms of age, with 15 being the oldest a singer could be, while the absolute youngest was 8. Before too long, by 2007 to be precise, people looked at that limit and thought, hang on, 8 years old is a bit young to be performing under this kind of pressure, so they shifted the lower limit up to 10. This was fine for about 10 years, funnily enough, before the producers once again thought, eh, this doesn't make sense. But this time, their reasoning was that it wasn't fair on the younger artists to be going up against older ones, so the limits were both shifted down by one year, making the minimum age 9 and the maximum age 14. So, rather stupidly, dear 15-year-olds of Europe, the EBU has basically decided that you aren't allowed to sing for one whole year of your life. Incidentally, Wikipedia reckons that there used to be a rule stipulating that all songwriters had to be aged between 10 and 15 before it was opened up to adult songwriters as of 2010, which continues to be the case to this day. I wonder if that applied to the 8-year-old competitors too. Like, you can sing this song, but you better not have written it because you're young enough to perform but not old enough to write? I don't know. Speaking of the songs themselves though, this is one major point of diversion between the adult and junior contests. While the adult contest had a very on-again, off-again relationship with this kind of rule, and quite rightly chose to abandon it in the end, the junior contest does still maintain that all songs must be performed at least mostly in their respective countries' native languages. Some people report the limit as being 60%, some say 75%, it's not clear really, but in short it has to constitute a majority of the lyrics in one way or another. And to be honest, despite my belief that the adult contest was right to scrap that rule, I also feel that the junior contest is correct to uphold it. As it is, the competitors will, mostly, make an effort to leave their comfort zone and, for instance, speak English for interviews or whatever. Even though they aren't obliged to in any way, they can speak their native language and Eurovision.tv will subtitle them as necessary. So they shouldn't be forced to discard their national identity in pursuit of nothing but points during their performances. Multiculturalism is absolutely good, of course, but not when it's enforced in such a way that might make the kids think that their own parent culture is worth less or something to be ashamed of. Does that make sense? Well, anyway, the last main distinction to consider is the voting system. Broadly speaking, it's kept pace with the adult contest in terms of how televoting was used and when jury votes were adopted and such like, but dig a little deeper and you'll find that it does, in fact, bear some striking differences from its parent, and not just because between 2005 and 2015 all songs got 12 points for free from the start to prevent anyone getting the dreaded nil point, not that anyone ever did anyway. For one, as I mentioned earlier, after a few years of wobbling, televoting was completely scrapped in favour of an online vote, which completely imploded the first time they tried to use it because the server was vastly overloaded with people trying to vote. In other words, they underestimated the popularity of the new system and had to delay its implementation by a year or two. Luckily though, they did figure it out in the end, and that's where we're at now. Whereas Adult Eurovision currently has the jury votes read out by spokespeople, followed by the televote scoreboard read out place by place as the two scores are added together, the junior contest, well, it's almost different, but not quite the same if that makes any sense. With the adult contest, the scores that are read out on behalf of the public vote basically amount to reading out what the scoreboard would look like with just the public votes and no jury input, and then the two scores are combined. In Junior Eurovision, meanwhile, 
The jury voting is exactly the same as the adult contest, but the public vote is actually calculated more like Melody Festival. Than. In short, they add together all the points that a country can give, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, and 12, and then multiply that number by the number of countries participating, and then award a proportional percentage of that number based on the percentage of votes each song receives, and those scores are delivered in the same way as the televoting at the adult contest. It's really not as complicated as it sounds. Simply put, if a song receives 2,500 online votes, and a total of 10,000 votes were cast, then they got one quarter of the votes available, so they get one quarter of the available points. See? But, you may ask, why bother having such a convoluted system in the first place? Well, since they scrapped the televote and brought in the online vote, anyone in the world is free to cast their votes without discrimination based on where they're voting from. Now, the slight catch with that is, someone could, hypothetically, vote for their own country if their country is taking part under this system. But, they've been clever with how the voting is implemented, and the system includes a couple of impressive anti-cheat features. For one, when voting online, you're forced to watch a full recap of each singer's final rehearsal, which is the same thing that the juries vote on. You get to watch the jury final recap. After that, you're allowed to cast your votes, but you have to vote for a minimum of three countries. You can't vote for one or two, and you can't vote for more than five. So you can vote for three or four or five countries and you can't vote for a country more than once. So while you do, in theory, have five votes to give, you can't give all five to one country. So that means that if someone wanted to spam vote for their own country, in theory, then their attempts would be mitigated by default because they would have to spam vote for at least two other countries in so doing. And this is saying nothing of limiting votes according to IP address where possible. Oh, and also, for your votes to count at all, you have to do one of those capture things to prove that you're not some kind of spam bot. So they really did think all of this through, and for making a system this crazy work so well, they deserve the utmost credit, because the past few years have proven that this system genuinely works wonders. Now, it's usually around this point in the video that I'd offer a rank, but much like with the Turkvision video, it'd feel weird to assign one single grade to an entire franchise like this, so I'll hold off. Instead, I'll just conclude that the Junior Contest is a growing, learning, changing creature that's immense fun to watch, and that inspires hope for the future talents of Europe and beyond. It's very well produced, frequently has songs and personalities that outstrip even the adult contest in terms of maturity, and it just goes to prove that, just because it's made with children in mind, doesn't automatically make it lesser or in any way diminished. So, whether you've got post-Eurovision blues or you just want some good tunes on an impressive stage, I highly recommend giving it a watch. It seems to me that the only people who try to shoot the contest down are embittered old farts who are jealous of the fact that the competitors are treated like people rather than being condescended to just for being young. Of course, if there is some valid criticism of the contest, I would genuinely love to hear it and discuss it in the comments below but I think you'd be hard-pressed to find anything reasonable to say against the contest. In any case, this is where I side off. So, before anything else, as ever, I should show my undying appreciation to the lovely people on patreon.com slash tesshex, who powered this video with their love and support, and you can too, for one dollar per video, or more if you feel that generous. In return, you get to see these videos ad-free a month before anyone else gets to see them, as well as access to the patrons-exclusive Discord channel on my server, and, as I said, if you feel more generous than that, I will reward you accordingly with even more bonus perks, including bonus videos, outtakes, and other even better stuff besides. Personal plugs aside, though, it just falls to me to say that, as ever, I have been, and will continue to be, tessellating hexagons, and thank you for watching if at this point you still are. Bye bye for now.